Alison cheerfully descended the clinic steps and practically hopped down the sidewalk towards home. Passers-by watched the joyful girl, whose radiance and positive attitude energised those around her. Of course, they did not understand the reason for Alison's joy and just smiled, looking at her. But she had a reason to be happy. Alison was pregnant. She had been dating Michael for nearly two years, patiently waiting for a marriage proposal. Michael, however, kept delaying that moment. Now, with the news of her pregnancy, Alison was certain they would marry. On her way home, the young woman stopped at the store to buy groceries. She planned to prepare a celebratory dinner and reveal the exciting news to Michael. Alison rented a room from a kind elderly woman, Mrs. Hewitt. They often spent their evenings drinking tea and sharing stories. Mrs. Hewitt would talk about her life and occasionally offer advice, always gently and heartfelt. When Alison first introduced Michael to Mrs. Hewitt, the landlady immediately expressed her belief that he wasn't a good match for Alison. Alison initially dismissed her opinion, thinking Mrs. Hewitt may have been jealous and fearing their shared evenings might end. However, Mrs. Hewitt still assured her she was a good judge of character and had seen through Michael. "'What makes you so sure we're not a couple?' Alison persisted. "'Alison, my dear, he's not a serious young man. You can't build a strong relationship with someone like him. You'll see. His true colours will show soon, and you'll remember my words.' However, as time passed and their relationship developed, Michael didn't disappoint her in any way. Alison relaxed and decided that Mrs. Hewitt was mistaken. After the doctor's appointment, Alison burst into the apartment. "'Mrs. Hewitt, I'm home!' she announced, so cheerfully and loudly that even the neighbours one floor below and above probably heard. "'My God, you're glowing!' Mrs. Hewitt smiled. "'Did you get a bonus? Or did you win the lottery?' "'No, no, something even better. I'll tell you now. You'll be happy too.' "'Just calm down first, then tell me.' "'I can't calm down. I can't. I'm the happiest person in the world!' Alison exclaimed. "'Sit down. I'll tell you everything now.' With slight impatience, Mrs. Hewitt looked at Alison. She was curious and could not stand secrets. "'I was at the women's clinic today.' Alison paused meaningfully, then added, "'I'm pregnant. Can you believe it? I'm going to have a baby!' Mrs. Hewitt looked at Alison in surprise, causing Alison to tense up. "'You're not happy?' Alison asked, sounding slightly upset. "'Oh, of course, I'm happy for you. A child is a woman's joy in the meaning of life, but who is the father?' Mrs. Hewitt inquired for some reason. "'What do you mean, who's the father? Michael, of course.' "'Oh, yes, why did I ask? Never mind, I'm just getting forgetful.' Mrs. Hewitt always used this phrase when she wanted to avoid discussing an unpleasant situation, and Alison had learned it over the last four years. "'Mrs. Hewitt, please don't upset me. Do you still think Michael isn't good enough for me? We've been together for two years. Has he ever done anything wrong? Acted dishonorably or offended me? No, he hasn't. So why don't you like him?' Alison asked her neighbour, holding back tears. I'm sorry, dear. I didn't mean to ruin your mood. But I just don't like your choice, that's all. I can't find any fault in him, but my gut tells me he's not right for you. When I marry him, then we'll see what you say, Alison replied resentfully. God willing, Mrs. Hewitt said doubtingly before retiring to her room. Alison's mood worsened. She went to the kitchen, unpacked the bags, and dialed her beloved's number with confidence. "'Michael, are you going to be late tonight?' "'I'm not sure yet. Why?' Michael asked. "'We have important plans for tonight. Please try to be home by seven. "'I will. What's happening?' Michael questioned further. Alison didn't give any specific answers, and promised to share the details in the evening. Usually, Alison invited Mrs. Hewitt to join them during dinner, but today she asked her to dine in her room. Mrs. Hewitt, I'd like for it to be just the two of us tonight. We can have dinner in my room, but it won't be very comfortable. Could we use the kitchen this evening? I'll bring your dinner to your room. I can, dear. We can. 
especially with my favourite movie on tonight. Thank you so, so much. Alison hugged the elderly woman. Michael arrived around 8pm. Alison, already nervous, had caught him several times to confirm his whereabouts in arrival time. Michael did not like this level of monitoring, and always reacted negatively to Alison's frequent calls. Why are you calling me every half an hour? I said I'm on my way. Okay, okay, I'm waiting for you. Just don't get nervous. Alison tried to calm him. Michael entered the apartment in a bad mood. It was unclear why he was upset today. He often mentioned having trouble at work, which frequently led him to come disgruntled. Sometimes it was Alison's calls that ruined his mood. Hi, honey. Everything's ready. Let's have dinner, Alison suggested. I'll wash my hands, muttered Michael, heading to the bathroom. Alison was nervous. She didn't know how to start the conversation, and Michael's mood was unsettling her. They sat at the festively set table, which Michael noticed. What did I miss? Is it someone's birthday? Or is it the landlady's day today? He asked. No, Michael, we're celebrating something else. You eat and then we'll talk. Tell me what's going on. I can't tolerate your secrets. Michael's mood hadn't improved, even after a delicious dinner, and Alison became anxious. Maybe I shouldn't tell him today, but why not? He'll be happy and his mood will improve, thought Alison to herself and said aloud, Michael, I went to the hospital today. Are you sick? Michael interrupted her. Not exactly, or rather, not at all. Alison paused for a moment and added confidently, We're going to have a baby. She anticipated him to embrace her like in the movies, kissing her, wrapping her in his arms. But Michael sat there, stunned, staring at Alison. I'm sorry, what did you say? He asked, barely audible. I said we're having a baby. I went to the clinic today and the doctor confirmed it. Aren't you happy? Tears welled up in Alison's eyes. She was deeply hurt by her beloved's reaction. The worst part was his silence. Say something, please, Alison pleaded. What do you want me to say? I don't know. Maybe that you're happy too? And if I'm not? Tears streamed down Alison's cheeks. They had discussed this topic a year before. Michael had mentioned that he didn't see himself as a father and thought it was too early for him to consider it. But now Alison was 28 and he was 33 years old, so they were quite mature to have a baby. The woman had hoped that Michael's views had changed, but clearly they hadn't. Why are you crying? What did I say? I told you before that I don't want to be a father. Can't I have that choice? Michael lashed out. You women dream of having a house full of children and dealing with the mess. I don't like it. I told you honestly before. But we haven't used protection for the last six months. I thought... I wonder what you thought. It's your responsibility to use protection or face the consequences. What do we do now? Alison asked through her tears. I'm nine weeks pregnant. You're being so naive. Even I know that up to 12 weeks, this problem can be easily resolved. A problem? A small living human being? Are you suggesting I get rid of it? Look, let's not create a scene. It's your choice. I'm not involved. Michael got up from the table and was about to leave the kitchen, but he paused and turned around. When you've made your decision, call me. I'm sorry to be blunt, but I don't need you pregnant. He left the apartment slamming the door loudly behind him. Alison was left alone in the kitchen. Her world had crumpled in an instant. All her dreams and plans were shattered in just a ten-minute conversation. She had hoped for a brighter future, but it seemed that happiness was not in her destiny. Alison rose from the table, glanced out the window, and decided it wasn't too late for a walk. She grabbed her sweater and confidently exited the apartment. Near her home, a small park was situated where she and Mrs. Hewitt would occasionally stroll before bed. However, today, she chose to walk alone, yearning for solitude with her thoughts. 
Alison settled on a bench at the park's far end and began reminiscing about her life, beginning with her childhood. Despite having a clear memory of her childhood, she often wished she didn't. Alison never knew her father. He existed somewhere, but she had never seen or known him. She attempted to learn about him from her mother multiple times, but her mother constantly concealed any information. They lived alone, and their financial situation was dire. Her mother worked two jobs, yet it was barely sufficient. At fifteen, Alison began working part-time at a supermarket to supplement their family income. The earnings were meagre, but it helped. When she turned sixteen, she was attacked, but fortunately her co-worker came to her help. After the incident, she left the market job and found work as an evening cleaner in a salon. After graduating from high school, Alison enrolled in nurse school. However, she left during her second year due to her mother's severe illness, which prevented her from studying full-time. She took a hairdressing course. To learn at least some kind of profession, Alison could not look for a job far from home because of her mother, and the hairdressing salons nearby were already fully staffed with masters. Thanks to a neighbour, Alison finally found employment as a sales clerk. This job was a lifeline for her. It provided a decent salary, and the convenience of the store being located in her house allowed her to take care of her mother when needed. Debbie, Alison's only close friend, was a stark contrast to her. While Alison was calm, quiet and introverted, Debbie was bright, loud and open-minded. Despite their differences, they had been friends since third grade. Debbie came from a middle-income family. She often gave Alison her items, bought food and sweets, and even taught her how to drive when they turned 19. Although Alison was initially reluctant, Debbie insisted. Do you know what kind of life you're going to have? What if you marry a millionaire and he gives you a car, but you can't drive? What will you do? Debbie smiled. Are you kidding me? What millionaire? Where will he come from? I don't know, but that's how it happens in the movies. Well, that's in the movies. In real life, I don't believe such things happen. Well, we'll see. After some time, Alison took a course and obtained her driver's license, encouraged by Debbie. Six months later, Alison's mother passed away from cancer, leaving the girl alone with only her friend for company. After a while, Alison changed her job. She found employment at a private firm working as a courier. The company provided her with a car. Three years flew by in the blink of an eye. One evening, while Alison was on her way home from work, Debbie called her, asking her to visit urgently. Upon arrival, Alison found her in a highly emotional state. "'Oh, my God, what's wrong?' Alison exclaimed, frightened. "'I'm going to tell you such a story now,' her friend began to intrigue. "'You'll just fall down.' "'I wouldn't like that,' Alison smiled. "'Tell me, what happened?' "'Do you remember Tom from the parallel class?' "'Which Tom? Wilkins?' "'Yes, that's him.' "'Well, I vaguely remember what he looks like. "'Of course I remember him, but I never had much contact with him. "'What happened to him?' "'Nothing happened to him,' Debbie hurriedly explained, "'her thoughts jumping from one to another. "'I met him by chance recently, "'and he proposed that we go to Italy for three years. "'We just need to arrange a quick sham marriage.' "'A sham marriage?' Alison wondered. "'Why would you do that? "'And why did he suggest you? "'Debbie, calm down and explain everything properly. "'I don't understand.' "'Oh, what don't you understand?' He's always had a soft spot for me at school, but I wasn't attracted to him. I didn't like him. Now we've met again, and he's so handsome and charming. We sat in a cafe reminiscing about school. When he walked me home, he proposed. Just imagine, it's Italy. When else will I have an opportunity to live there? All expenses paid by his company. They cover everything. Travel and accommodation. It's a fantastic opportunity. Three years in a foreign yet beautiful country, all expenses paid. Just to enjoy it. It's practically a jackpot. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't go. You obviously wouldn't. But I'm different, and I'm going. Even my parents gave me permission. Of course, go. It's your decision. You know, I've been considering a move for a while. 
And with you leaving, it's finally time. What am I going to do here without you? You're right. Why not give it a shot? Are you planning to sell your apartment? Not yet. I'm not sure how things will turn out. At least I'll have a place to return to. Everything here is familiar. And every dog knows you here, Debbie chimed in, causing both of them to laugh. Two weeks after this conversation, Debbie flew off to Italy, and Alison started packing for her move to the capital, which promised more opportunities. Upon arrival in the big city, Alison felt overwhelmed by the sheer number of people and the competitive job market. She also realised she hadn't arranged accommodation. After roaming the city, she found a small hotel where she could afford to stay temporarily, using the savings she had accumulated over the years. She rented a room for the night, deciding to start her apartment hunt the next morning, followed by a job search. In the morning, the girl responded to several rental ads, quickly realising that renting an apartment would be expensive. She decided to look for a room instead. However, finding a good room with a female roommate proved challenging. Most ads were either from female students, who often had active social lives and frequent parties, or from elderly men. Disheartened, Alison wandered around the city, unsure of what to do next. She sat down on a bench and began to cry, feeling a deep sense of self-pity. What kind of life is this? she thought to herself. I don't even have anyone to ask for advice. Suddenly, someone touched her shoulder. Sweetheart, why are you crying? Who upset you? Alison looked up to find a pleasant-looking elderly woman, around 70 or 80 years old, standing in front of her. For some reason, Alison felt she could trust this woman, so she poured out her concerns without hesitation. What a coincidence! the elderly woman exclaimed. I'm actually looking for a respectable female tenant. I don't prefer students due to the noise, but someone like you, calm and kind, would be an ideal fit. I own a spacious house, so there's plenty of room. However, I should warn you that there's another tenant already. I'm not sure how you'll feel about him. Alison tensed up. She didn't want a man living in the apartment. Is he a relative of yours? Even more. This is my cat, smiled the elderly woman. We've been living together for nine years, and my name is Mrs. Hewitt. So, will you come to live with me? Of course I will, Alison rejoiced. Okay, give me a piece of paper and a pen. I'll write down my address. Retrieve your stuff from the hotel and come home tonight. The words, come home tonight, filled Alison with a sudden warmth and calmness. It felt as if her own grandmother, with whom she had reconciled after a quarrel, was waiting for her at home. Alison never knew her grandparents. Her grandmother passed away before she was born, and her grandfather, her mother's father, died when she was just two. She barely remembered him, only from pictures. After collecting her belongings from the hotel, Alison took a cab to the given address. Mrs. Hewitt welcomed Alison like a cherished guest. She set the table, baked a cake, prepared a room, and laid out new bed linens. For some reason, Alison felt at home. She was comfortable and warm in this foreign apartment with a stranger. She hadn't felt so at ease, not even at home in the company of her own mother, and so Alison stayed with Mrs. Hewitt for many years. Alison's reminiscing was interrupted by the familiar voice of the elderly woman. "'My dear, remember, I have high blood pressure. I can't be so worried. Where did you go? What happened?' Mrs. Hewitt, you were right. He's a traitor. He doesn't want me or the child. He asked me to have an abortion, and only then would he consider coming back. What a jerk, but I hope you won't do something as drastic as that. Of course not. I'm twenty-eight. Why would I give up my own child? I'll follow in my mother's footsteps and raise the child alone. You know, it's better to be alone than with such a man. We'll manage on our own. I can still help with the little one. I don't have my own grandchildren, so I'll babysit. Alison knew that Mrs. Hewitt had a son who died in the line of duty at the age of 30. He had been married, but did not have time to have children. His ex-wife occasionally visited Mrs. Hewitt, 
but not often. She had another family and children of her own. Mrs. Hewitt sat down next to Alison on the bench. You know, Alison, it's better to find out he's a scoundrel now than after you're married. I understand, but it's so hurtful and painful. You were right when you said he wasn't right for me. Mrs. Hewitt, will I ever find someone? Of course you will. Don't even doubt it. I believe you, Alison said quietly, or at least I want to. Let's go home. It's cold today and we shouldn't be out in this. Let's have some tea and go to bed. Tomorrow is a new day. They left the bench and walked home at a leisurely pace. The next day, Alison had the day off and decided to sleep in. She woke up closer to noon, finding Mrs. Hewitt busy in the kitchen. Half asleep, Alison offered to help. You just woke up. Go freshen up. I'll make you breakfast. I don't want breakfast. Just some coffee. No, that's not good. You need a proper breakfast. I made a cottage cheese casserole. Remember, you need to eat well now, not just coffee and sandwiches. Right, I'm not used to this new situation yet. Thank you, Mrs. Hewitt. At breakfast, the elderly woman asked Alison about her plans. Have you considered a job change? Working in a warehouse isn't ideal for a pregnant woman. You need something more laid back, without physical strain. What did the doctor say? Are you doing all right? Generally, yes, but I should avoid heavy lifting. You see, we need to consider alternatives before your maternity leave. I understand, but where can I apply? I lack formal education. I've only been a courier and a storekeeper, which aren't suitable now. What other skills do you have? I used to sell at a market, but it wasn't a good experience. I also took a hairdressing course a long time ago, but I lack practical experience. That's it, I don't have any other skills. Yes, that's a problem, Mrs. Hewitt said. Don't worry, we'll think of something. After breakfast, Alison decided to take a walk and stop by the church she sometimes attended to pray and ask for help or clues about what to do next. Sometime later, leaving the church, she saw a brightly coloured taxi cab. The words, female cab, were emblazoned on it, and an idea struck her. That's brilliant. I can drive. I have a license and four years of experience. I can at least try it, she thought. She approached the woman behind the wheel. Excuse me, would it be possible to get a job with your company? The woman handed Alison a business card. Call the bottom phone number and tell them you're inquiring about the driver position. They're expanding the team right now. Thank you so much. Alison stepped aside, joyous, and dialed the number. A pleasant female voice confirmed the vacancy and scheduled an appointment for Alison to meet the manager the next day at 10 a.m. Excited, Alison immediately rushed home to share the news with Mrs. Hewitt. The elderly woman was not overly thrilled, noting that driving can strain the lower back, which might not be ideal for a pregnant woman. I'm not planning to work until I'm nine months pregnant, but for at least five months so I can save more money. I've been saving all this time, but soon I'll have to start spending because baby items are expensive. Once the money's gone, I'll need to manage with a newborn. Alison reasoned, and Mrs. Hewitt agreed with her. After a successful interview, Alison was hired by the cab company. Excited about her new role, she was scheduled to start her first shift the following day. On her first day, Alison was quite nervous. She made a point to be polite, wishing all her passengers a good day or evening. Some passengers left a tip. Others looked surprised, but no one was negative. This pleased Alison immensely. Months passed and Alison's belly began to round. She feared her bosses would notice and terminate her employment. She loved her job and didn't want to lose it. One day, Alison received a peculiar order to pick up a client from one address and drive him to a distant neighbourhood. This area was known for its dysfunction and criminal activity, making cab drivers reluctant to venture there. Alison pulled up to the specified address, and a woman walked up to the car and opened the front door. Alison felt a pang of discomfort. She preferred not having passengers sit next to her, but she held her tongue, believing the customer is always right. 
The woman's appearance was peculiar. A long dress, a hoodie in an odd colour, various bracelets and neck beads, and multiple rings on her fingers. Her style suggested that of a gypsy, but she clearly did not belong to that ethnic group. Good afternoon, the woman greeted, her voice pleasant and almost hypnotic, her gaze intense. Hello, please have a seat and buckle up, Alison responded politely. The woman complied and fastened her seatbelt. Out of the blue, the woman asked, Aren't you afraid to drive? It's not the best job for someone in your condition. What condition? Alison feigned ignorance. Do you think you can fool me? The woman smiled gently. No, I am genuinely unsure about what you're referring to, Alison replied, holding her ground. Okay, why don't you like your name? Do you think it's worse than everyone else's? Alison was taken aback by this. She didn't believe in psychics or fortune tellers, but the woman's words were true. She really didn't like her name. I wonder what else she could say, Alison thought, and then she heard the next words. Your Michael is no match for you. It's good that he left. You should have listened to your eldest when she told you he wasn't right for you. In surprise, Alison jerked the steering wheel. She slowed down slightly and looked at her passenger with intrigue. You still don't believe me, do you? The woman asked with a squint, but she was smiling. It's hard not to believe when you know so much, Alison exclaimed. I see a lot, the woman replied. What else do you see? Alison asked, curious despite her disbelief in predictions. She was eager to hear something good about her future. What are you interested in? I don't know. Like, will I ever have a decent man? Will I have a healthy child? And will I have more children? Wow, you have many questions. Luckily, they can all be answered with one word. Yes. Are there any details? Alison, like most women, was curious. No. Why? Because then life would be uninteresting. You're odd. Most fortune tellers provide detailed fortunes. But you're so cryptic. What's your name? Alison asked, somewhat off topic. Bernadette. And mine is. Alison. The passenger finished for the girl. At that moment, they turned to the right street, and Alison felt sad because their drive was almost over. The surrounding atmosphere was indeed not pleasant. Alison was in this neighborhood for the first time. Do you live here? she asked Bernadette. No, a kind man who needs help lives here. Should I wait for you? No, that's okay. Stop by that abandoned house, Bernadette said. Alison pulled over. How much do I owe you? Nothing at all. It's been a pleasure just talking to you. Do you have a pen and a piece of paper? Bernadette suddenly asked. Yes, right away. Alison opened the glove compartment, took out a notepad and pen, and handed them to her. Bernadette wrote something, tore out the sheet, and folded it several times. Read this when you get home. Promise not to open it before then. Now be happy and take care of yourself. The words had a certain meaningful tone, but it wasn't threatening. Thank you, and have a good day. Bernadette closed the door and disappeared into the darkness of the abandoned house. Alison barely made it through the rest of the day, and when it was over she rushed home impatiently. She was bursting with curiosity and couldn't wait to read the note. She arrived home, dropped her bag in the hallway, washed her hands, and pulled out the cherished piece of paper from her pocket. On it was written an address, or rather, the name of a small town about 150 kilometres from the capital, and a name, Robert Cassidy, just below was the inscription. Find this man and tell him whose daughter you are. He will help you. Alison stared at the piece of paper, struggling to understand its meaning. The idea of visiting a stranger's house in a different town and revealing her lineage from the doorstep felt odd and foolish. She decided to consult Mrs. Hewitt for advice. She narrated her meeting with Bernadette, their conversation, 
and the peculiar note. Mrs. Hewitt listened with great surprise. How intriguing and surprisingly straightforward. What a fascinating note, said Mrs. Hewitt. Do you think I should go? asked Alison. You should. What have you got to lose? What if this man can genuinely help you? Have you heard his name before? No, he's a total stranger to me. Could we possibly find his surname on the internet? Mrs. Hewitt suddenly suggested. That's a great idea. Why didn't I think of it earlier? We can enter his details and city into a search engine, though I'm not sure about his age, Alison replied. Alison grabbed her laptop, opened a search engine and inputted the city, surname and first name. The search results left her stunned. There was only one person in that town with those details. Mrs. Hewitt, look who he is! Alison turned the laptop to show the elderly woman a picture of Robert Cassidy and his title. He was the mayor of that very city. What a twist! Mrs. Hewitt exclaimed in surprise. And how will you get to him? Want me to accompany you? No, with your health condition, you'd better stay. Your trips should only be to the nearby park. I have the day off tomorrow, so I'll manage, Alison assured her. The following evening, Alison lay in bed preparing for the trip. She pondered who this man was and how he could assist her. The idea of telling him about herself seemed ridiculous. She considered different scenarios and laughed at their absurdity. Hello, I'm Alison Rattel. My mum is Miriam Rattel. Oh, why aren't you pleased? That's insane. Maybe I shouldn't even go. Alison questioned herself. I bet Mr. Cassidy is living perfectly fine without knowing who my mother is. Why would he need this information anyway? Lost in her thoughts, she fell asleep. The next morning, Alison arrived at the bus station, bought a ticket and took a seat by the window, contemplating her next moves once she reached the town. She had two options. Wait for him at town hall, hoping he would leave during the day, or try to find his home address online and wait outside his house. No, that's not an option. What if he comes home late? How will I return to my town? And where will I spend the night? On the street? Absolutely not. So my only choice is town hall. Alison arrived in the city around ten o'clock in the morning. The weather was pleasant, with a slight breeze and the sun shining, but it wasn't too hot. She strolled through the park near the town hall when she noticed a woman heading there, dressed in a business suit and towering stiletto heels. Alison found herself captivated by this stranger, but she couldn't pinpoint why. Suddenly the woman tripped and fell. Alison rushed to help her. Should I call an ambulance? Are you okay? Alison asked. I think I sprained my ankle, replied the woman fighting back tears. My mum warned me about wearing these stilettos. Please help me get to my office. I work at Town Hall. Of course. Alison was thrilled to have an excuse to enter the building. They walked slowly towards the entrance. A guard, noticing the woman's distress, also suggested calling an ambulance, but the woman, whose name was Holly, adamantly declined. They made their way to the second floor and approached the mayor's reception area. "'We're here. Thank you so much,' Holly expressed her gratitude. "'How can I thank you? Perhaps some coffee or tea?' This was the moment Alison had been waiting for. "'No, thank you. No need for coffee or tea. But I do need your help. I need a few minutes with Mr. Cassidy.' I've travelled from out of town to give him some important information. It's not easy to get to him. Can you assist? Alison folded her hands pleadingly. No problem, Holly agreed too quickly. Does he let everyone in without an appointment? Alison asked, puzzled. Don't you know? Our mayor is a unique leader, discussed widely beyond our town. He doesn't schedule personal appointments. If he's in his office and free, it's easy to see him. That's the first time I've heard of such a thing. Alison was genuinely surprised. Yes, many people are. So your request isn't unusual. You would have gotten an appointment anyway. Maybe you'd like some tea after all, especially since Mr. Cassidy hasn't arrived yet. All right, agreed. Let's have tea. Alison waited for the mayor for about 40 minutes. She finished her cup of tea when the reception area's door opened and a dignified-looking man in his fifties walked in. 
He had an athletic build, broad-shouldered and trim, signalling regular visits to the gym. He was dressed in a dark grey suit, a light satin shirt and an understated tie. As Alison studied his face, she wondered if they had met before. But she was sure she would remember him. He had thick black hair, untouched by grey, blue eyes and well-shaped lips. However, what caught Alison's attention most was his gaze. It was stern, yet warm, an intriguing combination that was difficult to ignore as he looked intently at the unfamiliar woman in his reception area. "'Are you here to see me?' His voice was so loud and confident that Alison flinched. "'Yes, may I?' He invited Alison into his office, and she sat down opposite his chair. Not knowing how to start the conversation, she sat in silence for a while. The mayor was patient, understanding the strange woman's anxiety and not wanting to rush her. However, he could not wait for her indefinitely. "'I'm sorry, young lady, but I have a lot to do,' he said finally. "'Could you get to the point? Do you need my help? Go ahead, I'll try my best to solve the problem.' "'Okay, don't be startled by anything I say. I'm not entirely sure of what's happening myself. But I've been instructed to find you and share some information, Alison replied. Mr. Cassidy raised his eyebrows in surprise. I'm unsure of what you mean. Who instructed you to do so? And what information are you supposed to share with me? Alison gathered her courage and finally laid everything out for him. Initially, the mayor looked at her with distrust and suspicion, but as she relayed her message, the mayor clutched his heart, feeling sick. "'Are you ill?' Alison asked, genuinely worried. "'Should we call an ambulance?' "'No need,' the mayor replied. "'Please bring me some water. It will help.' Alison fetched a glass of water and stood beside him. "'How old are you?' Mr. Cassidy said finally. Twenty-eight. Why?' The mayor covered his face with his hands, laughing. Finding his reaction unusual, Alison soon realized he wasn't laughing, but crying. Why are you crying? If I had known I'd upset him so much, I wouldn't have come, she thought to herself. Once composed, the mayor peered at Alison with a different expression, as if studying her. Can you at least explain something to me? I don't understand anything she added. I shouldn't worry. I'm pregnant. Your name is Alison. That's a nice name. Are you pregnant? Do you have a husband? Was your mother ill when she died? Or was it sudden? Where do you live? How was your childhood? Was your mother married? Is your grandfather still alive? Mr. Cassidy bombarded her with questions as if emptying a cornucopia it was clear he was deeply excited. Alison was stunned, but didn't realise anything until she heard him say to himself, Oh my God, I have a daughter. I can't believe it. And soon a grandchild. Alison was stunned. Father? That's my father? It can't be. She didn't know how to react. On one hand, she had her new-found relative. On the other, this man had betrayed her mother years ago when he abandoned her. Unlike many women, Alison was not impulsive and always made decisions based on logic and common sense. Therefore, she decided to hear her father's account of her birth before deciding whether to continue communicating with him. His joyous reaction suggested that the news was welcome. "'Excuse me, if you're so happy now,' Why did you abandon my mum when you found out she was pregnant? She asked, the question aching as she had recently experienced abandonment when she revealed her own pregnancy. I didn't abandon your mum. In fact, I didn't even know she was pregnant. If you'll allow me, I'll explain everything to you, he replied. Alison nodded, and the man walked to the door and said to his secretary, Holly, I'm not available for anyone today. He then returned to his desk, sat across from Alison, and pondered where to begin his story. We met Nina 29 years ago at a resort. Having just finished university, my parents gifted me a trip to the sea. 
Nina was on vacation with her parents. I noticed her on the beach, but didn't dare approach her, as she was with her parents. That evening, she came to the dance unaccompanied, and I asked her to dance. We talked and discovered many shared topics and interests. We then took a stroll to the night sea. We parted ways in the morning, after spending the night on the beach, just talking. When she returned to her room, I realized I was in love. I'd never felt this way before. Your mum was a beautiful woman, not just in appearance but in spirit. She had an incredible inner world. Her speech was like a song. It was impossible not to fall in love with such a woman. We met again on the beach in the afternoon, exchanged a few words and planned to go to the movies that evening. Nina mentioned that she got in trouble for returning late previously and would need to return early today. I was surprised by this control, given she was already twenty. She was mature, but I could tell she feared her parents, especially her father. We went to the movies that night. I don't know what she told them, but her parents let her go. After the movie, we returned to the beach. That's when I kissed her for the first time and realized I was in deep. I was at a loss. Proposing to a girl you've known for two days would seem absurd and foolish. No one would believe the sincerity of my feelings and intentions, even though they were genuine. We stayed on the beach until 2 a.m., after which I walked her to her room. The next day, Nina was nowhere to be seen, neither on the beach nor in the dining room. At dinner, I noticed that Nina's mother took her portion with her. Assuming Nina was unwell, I decided to check on her. I went to their room and knocked. Nina's mother opened the door and, in an irritated tone, asked what I wanted. I candidly admitted that I had recently met her daughter and was fond of her. I noticed her absence and wanted to know if she was okay or unwell. In response, I received a curt reply. It's none of your business what happens to our daughter. Go chase other girls, young man. We didn't raise her for you. And the door was abruptly shut in my face. I must admit I was unprepared for such a reaction. I was taken aback by the parents' behaviour and the rigid boundaries they imposed on their adult daughter. Two days later, Nina appeared on the beach. She seemed different, as if someone had taken her place. Even the sparkle in her eyes was missing. I felt the need to talk to her. I asked a nine-year-old boy to discreetly hand her a note, indicating where I'd be waiting for her that evening. Nina arrived almost an hour late, but I would have waited until morning. I was eager for this conversation, wanting to understand what was happening. Mr. Cassidy, I can't explain everything. It's not easy for a normal person to understand, but we can never be together, she said. Why? Don't you like me? I asked. I do like you, a lot, but my father disapproves of you, strongly. I could never go against his wishes. Are we in the Middle Ages? Will you let him dictate your life choices? Who you will marry? I won't discuss this with you. I'm sorry, but I truly cannot be with you, she replied, tears streaming down her face. I saw her tears of resentment and despair, caused by this outrageous injustice and irrationality. I put my arm around her shoulder. Suddenly she turned to me and kissed me passionately. I couldn't resist. It was the first and last time I never saw her again. In the morning I learned that they had left at dawn, probably shortly after Nina returned to the room, for we had only parted that morning. That's the story. I wanted to find her and I knew her last name and her town, but I didn't dare. About a year later, I happened to be in her city. I even found her address and visited her. However, her father answered the door and he chased me away, threatening to kill me next time. Alison listened holding her breath. She remembered, from her mother's words, that her grandfather was strict, but not that strict, but that her mother had broken, that was obvious. Now that Alison knew the whole story, she understood why her mother had become so, and rude. She felt sorry for her. But why did she keep me at a distance and treat me like her parents treated her? 
she should have understood more than anyone how hurt and offended I was. But the pressure she had experienced all her life must have squeezed out all the goodness that once resided in her soul during her youth, thought Alison. Are you married? she asked aloud. No, I've been trying to forget Nina for a long time, and even met other girls, but it wasn't the same. There was an emptiness in my soul. I've become so accustomed to solitude that it no longer bothers me. However, your arrival in my life is like a breath of fresh air, a ray of sunshine in a dark kingdom. I can't think of other words to express the joy of your arrival, especially with a grandchild. It's literally a jackpot. Please tell me about yourself. Where do you live? What do you do? Do you have a husband? I'm interested in everything. Alison shared everything she could remember about her childhood with her father, her strained relationship with her mother, her mother's illness and death, her relocation to the capital, her unsuccessful relationship with Michael, and the most radiant and wise person she knew, Mrs. Hewitt. I want you to live with me. We have so much to catch up on. I can't leave, Mrs. Hewitt. She has no one else but me. I'm not a stranger to you, am I? And as for Mrs. Hewitt, I wouldn't mind if you bring her along. It would be even more fun. Alison looked at her father in surprise. Isn't she a stranger to you? She supported you in your time of need, so I'm also grateful to her. It's settled then. You're moving in with me. Alison suddenly remembered her first meeting with Mrs. Hewitt and decided to joke. There's just one problem. Besides me and Mrs. Hewitt, there's another tenant. Who? A cat, Alison smiled. That's no problem. You can even have a dog. My house is big. There's plenty of room for everyone. I'll need to go back to the city to get my things and explain everything to Mrs. Hewitt, to prepare her, somehow. Of course I understand, but let's have you stay at my place tonight, and tomorrow Adam will take you there. Alison agreed with pleasure. She wanted to spend more time with her father, to speak with her family man. Afterward, Mr. Cassidy and Alice left the office. The secretary watched Alison with interest, not understanding who this young woman was and why the mayor had cancelled all his meetings and appointments for her sake. They went to a restaurant for lunch, intending to get to know each other further through conversation. Mr. Cassidy asked Alison about her interests, favourite meals, books and films, seemingly determined to learn as much as he could about his daughter in two hours. Alison responded and posed her own questions, equally interested in understanding her father. Their conversation was interrupted by a phone call. Hello, is this Alison Rattel? An unfamiliar female voice inquired. Yes, who am I speaking with? Alison asked, her tone revealing a hint of apprehension. This is a doctor from the hospital where Michael Voropayev is currently admitted. Do you know him? The woman on the line asked. Yes, I do. What happened to him? Alison was confused. They had broken up, and he had people closer to him that could be contacted. He had an accident and asked me to call you. He's in serious condition. Can you come to the hospital today? I can't. I'm out of town and won't be able to reach in time. I'll be there tomorrow morning, Alison answered. After the conversation, Alison was in doubt, not knowing what to do or how to behave. I think you should visit him. I'm not saying you should forgive him or take care of him, but he's not a stranger to you. You were together for two years, her father suggested. You're right, father, Alison agreed. It was the first time she had called him father. Tears welled up in Mr. Cassidy's eyes. The grown man, usually so serious, was surprisingly sentimental and sensitive. Thank you, he said, holding his daughter's hand. For what? Alison asked, puzzled. For calling me Daddy. They left the restaurant and drove to his house. The mayor's house was significantly larger than the surrounding private properties. Mr. Cassidy noticed Alison's gaze and understood what she was thinking. Don't look at how big the house is. I never steal the state's money. 
I used to run a construction business. I built this house before I ventured into politics. So it's all fair and legal. I didn't think anything of the sort. Alison felt embarrassed, because that's precisely what she had initially thought. All right, her father smiled, pretending to believe her. Alison walked into the house, taken aback. She had never seen such splendour, except in the movies. Everything was skillfully and creatively put together. It was evident that a professional designer had meticulously considered every detail in the house. Intrigued, Alison examined the furniture, pictures, statuettes, vases and dishes. Alison, come on, I'll show you your room. They ascended to the upstairs. There were several doors, one of which her father gestured Alison to enter. The room was adorned in a gentle green colour, so subtle barely discernible, yet incredibly soothing to the eyes. A massive bed stood in the room's centre, flanked by snow-white nightstands with small lamps on them. A snow-white closet lined the wall. Everything was so beautiful, immaculate, and shiny, that Alison was hesitant to touch anything, fearing she'd leave marks or make it dirty. Alison's father gave her a smile. Knowing the hardships his daughter had faced growing up, he was determined to make up for those lost emotions and ensure a decent standard of living for her. Would you like to take a rest? he asked. To be honest, I would. I didn't realize how tired I was until I saw the bed, Alison confessed. Then rest. I'll prepare dinner. Would you prefer fish or meat? I would love some fish. I'm quite fond of it. Once her father left the room, Alison quickly fell asleep from exhaustion. During dinner, Mr. Cassidy informed Alison that his driver, Adam, would pick her up the next morning at 8 a.m. Adam would take her to the hospital, then to Mrs. Hewitt's apartment, and finally back home with the cat and the elderly woman. Oh, I don't want to cause you any inconvenience, Alison mentioned. What do you mean? I'm your father, and it's my responsibility to take care of my daughter, especially in a situation like this, he said, pausing for a while before adding, Let's make a deal. If you need something, tell me right away. He took a bank card out of his pocket and placed it in front of Alison. This is your card. It'll always have money on it. And don't you dare argue, it's useless. The pin code is the day and month of your mother's birthday. I've got money. Thanks, Dad. I don't need it. Alison tried to refuse. Alison, my girl, you don't think I'm going to let you work in your condition, do you? Girls always need money for stuff. Also, take only the most important and necessary things with you. We'll buy everything else here. And Mrs. Hewitt, too. Thank you, but I think... My dear, I think we've agreed. It's useless to argue with me. I suggest we take a walk before bed and rest. You have a busy day tomorrow. You need a good night's sleep. They walked around the garden, strolled down an alley, sat on a bench for a while and then returned to the house. Alison said good night to her father and went up to her room. Before taking a shower, she dialed Mrs. Hewitt. How are you, darling? How is your father treating you? Alison had already phoned her in the afternoon, sharing the news about her father's exciting find. Mrs. Hewitt was thrilled. There are two pieces of news, Granny, Alison began. Good and bad? the elderly woman asked, smiling. No, both are good. Just relax, OK? Alison requested. Dad wants me to live with him. That's the first news. That's excellent news. Absolutely the right decision. You should live with your father. So what's the other news? Mrs. Hewitt, I want you to come with me. Please, please. Dad personally invites you. He doesn't want you to be alone. There was silence on the phone. Alison, concerned for the elderly woman, exclaimed, Mrs. Hewitt, are you okay? Yes, she responded, her voice choked with tears. It was then that Alison realised the elderly woman was crying. Thank you, dear, but I don't think it's a good idea. I'm a stranger to you, 
and even more so to your father. Why would you want to take on such a burden? How can you say that? A burden? You're critical to me. You practically saved me, and I can't leave you behind. If you don't go, then I won't go either, Alison insisted. All right, I'll think about it until tomorrow, Mrs. Hewitt said and hung up. Alison, with a happy smile, showered and went to bed. In the morning, after breakfast, she and her father stepped outside, just as Adam pulled up to the entrance. Alison froze as she saw him. He resembled her favourite actor. There's no way such a handsome man could be just a driver, she thought to herself, before turning to her father. This is your driver? Yes, but Adam is more than a driver, the man replied. He's also a security guard and a master of sports in karate. He had to retire from professional sports due to a minor injury. He's an excellent and educated guy. You'll see when you talk to him. Adam, I trust you with the most precious thing in my life. My daughter. Watch over her. You're responsible, Mr. Cassidy stated seriously. Do you really have a daughter? This is the first I've heard of it. Adam responded, surprised. You won't believe it. I just found out about her yesterday. Life is full of miracles. And you don't believe in miracles. Mr. Cassidy smiled, then reiterated, Drive carefully, as if you had a crystal vase in your car. Don't worry. Your warning is noted. Everything will be fine, the driver assured. They rode in silence for the first ten minutes, Alison felt awkward, because Adam resembled a famous actor, and she was too shy to even look at him. Adam kept his eyes on the road, patiently waiting for his passenger to initiate conversation. Alison gathered her courage and broke the silence. Adam, has anyone ever told you that you resemble the actor Adam Sandler? Alison asked, and Adam laughed. How do I resemble him? We only have the same name. Don't be modest. You just look like him, Alison insisted. Have you seen his movies? Honestly, I don't recall. I don't usually remember actors. Why? Bad memory? No, I just tend to remember actresses more, Adam grinned. I'm a typical man. I prefer women. Alison blushed deeply, feeling a pang of jealousy. Adam's statement had somehow made her feel uncomfortable. Alison, what do you do besides watching movies? I live, I work. Are you married? He suddenly asked. Alison blushed again. Why do you want to know? I'm curious. Maybe I'm searching for a bride. You're just my type. I like intelligent, interesting and incredibly modest girls who blush from head to toe when asked a question. Alison blushed even more and turned towards the window. "'You're purposely making me feel embarrassed, aren't you?' she asked, continuing to look out the window. "'Excuse me, who are you talking to over the window?' Adam jokingly asked, and they both laughed. "'If you're seriously asking, I'm not the right person for you,' Alison replied sadly. "'May I ask why?' "'I'm pregnant.' "'And what?' Adam asked, then quickly understood. Oh, sorry, I didn't get it right away. You have a fiancé and you're getting married, right? If that's the case, I'm not interested in someone else's bride. No, I don't have a fiancé, Alison replied. Then why am I not suitable for you? Because I'm pregnant with another man's child, Alison explained. Don't you think your child needs a father? Adam asked. I suppose, but not every man is willing to raise another man's child. I agree, not every man would. But I'm not just any man. I'm unique, Adam responded with a sincere smile, winking at Alison, which made her blush once more. Alison looked at Adam questioningly, unsure if he was joking or serious. Are you kidding? I don't think this is a topic to joke about, Alison exclaimed. No, 
I'm not kidding. You're an incredible girl. It's immediately obvious. You have a special energy that affects me, Adam said. At this moment, they pulled up to the hospital. As Alison stepped out of the car, she suddenly winced and clutched her belly. What's wrong? Adam asked, alarmed. Are you ill? Do you need a doctor? No, I think the baby just kicked. Alison said with a smile and changed the topic. I won't be long. Please, wait for me in the car. She easily found Michael's ward and walked inside. Michael was lying on the bed gazing at the ceiling. Upon seeing Alison, his demeanour changed, becoming more lively and cheerful. His right arm and leg were bandaged, and a large abrasion and bruise marred his face. "'Hi, Michael. What happened?' Alison asked, taking a seat next to him. "'Hi, Alison. I'm so happy to see you,' Michael replied with apparent sincerity. "'Don't ask. We got into a mess with Ben. Don't worry, he's alive. But he's in worse shape than me. He has spinal issues.' "'I'm sorry to hear that. What about you?' "'I've got a fractured arm and leg. There's also something wrong with my foot. I need surgery urgently.' I see. How are you? How are you doing without me? I'm fine. I live, work. Do you miss me? Michael asked, most likely hoping to satisfy his ego. Not any more. I've gotten used to living without you. You hurt me too much. I'm sorry. Please. Alison wondered if he really wanted to reconcile and raise a child with her, Maybe the accident had changed his perspective, and he had proposed to her. However, soon reality proved otherwise. What Alison heard next shocked her. I'm sorry, but you haven't exactly been fair to me either. I told you I didn't want kids, and here's a surprise, you're pregnant. How am I supposed to react? I don't understand. Are you apologising or blaming me? Alison asked for clarification. Apologising? in a very peculiar way, I must say. I need money for rehab. Insurance won't cover it. I was drunk. My parents can't afford it, and after recently buying a car, I can't either. Don't you know that I can't afford it either? You could sell your apartment. Alison hadn't expected such audacity. Wait, what? I should sell my mother's apartment to pay for your surgery. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, yes, we're not strangers. We could help each other in difficult times. I'm in a difficult situation, and I have no one else to ask. Besides, you're carrying my baby, and for it to be yours, you should pay me as a donor. You obtained my contribution fraudulently. I gave no consent. You owe me. Alison was speechless. She had anticipated any response but this one. She was so taken aback, she had no idea how to respond. After recovering from her shock, she asked, Did you hit your head in the accident? Have you seen a neurologist? No, there's nothing wrong with my head. You must be sick in the head. You're not getting a penny from me. I thought you invited me here to apologise and raise our child together. I was even ready to ask my father for help. But after what I've heard, forget it. She stood up, walked to the door, and turned back to say, Don't ever contact me again or come near me. Otherwise, my father or my future husband will handle you. She said, smiling enigmatically. Take care of yourself. Alison left the room her head held high. She managed to hold back the tears until she left the hospital, where she broke down crying. Adam, who had been waiting by the car, rushed over when he saw Alison crying. What's wrong? Did someone hurt you? What happened? No, nothing happened. I just realised my past is worse than I thought. I feel like I need to shower, as if I'm covered in mud. Maybe I should talk to someone, just man-to-man -man conversation, Adam suggested. No, there's no point. Let's just go home. I need to pack and take Mrs. Hewitt, Alison said. 
The smell of Mrs. Hewitt's pies filled the air, even in the entrance. Mrs. Hewitt is making pies. She cooks so deliciously, Alison commented, unlocking the door. Mrs. Hewitt, I'm here. Finally, what took you so long? The elderly woman said, emerging from the kitchen. She glanced at Adam, giving a nod of approval. That's what I mean. A real reliable man, unlike some others. Alison smiled, embarrassed, and asked, Why are you baking pies? We need to go, Alison objected. I've already finished, so you'll have something to eat before the road, Mrs. Hewitt replied. And Alison, I'm not going. What use am I? I'm old and ill. Your father probably agreed, just from the joy of having a daughter. He'll soon kick me out and I'll be left on the street. I prefer to spend my remaining days here. Firstly, if you don't go, I don't go. Secondly, my father is a sensible man considering his position. He must have thought before he spoke. Lastly, I will never let anyone throw you onto the street. And by the way, could a bad man produce a good girl like me? She's very humble as well, remarked Adam, smiling, and the women laughed. We have an hour to pack, Mrs. Hewitt. We'll only take the most valuable, expensive and necessary items. That said, we will get everything else we need later. An hour later, they were all set to leave. All they had to do was hand over the keys to the neighbour and ask her to water the plants occasionally and look after the apartment. The cat was put in a carrier and meowed all through the hallway, clearly not a fan of the outdoors. By eight o'clock they were already home. Mr. Cassidy greeted them at the gate. Mrs. Hewitt was quite nervous, but Alison's father turned out to be a truly kind man and a gracious host. He gave her a room downstairs so she wouldn't have to climb the stairs every day. The room was adjacent to the library, a real treat for Mrs. Hewitt, who was an avid reader, despite her age and deteriorating vision. The cat was let loose in the living room, sniffing around his new territory with a sense of pride. Mr. Cassidy wanted to let Adam go home, but Alison insisted that he stay with them for dinner. Dad, she turned to her father. Say, if I wanted to get married, would you mind? Did the baby's father come to his senses and propose to you after all? asked the man, surprised and incredulous at the same time. No, said Alison, and looked at her father, as if considering whether to tell him about her conversation with Michael. But after thinking about it, she decided to tell him. Mr. Cassidy was angry at first, and then laughed. My God, how mentally impoverished some men could be! What kind of a person would he have to be to come up with such a thing in principle? What a scoundrel! Yes, Dad, I'm shocked too. So, who are you planning to marry? Is there something else I'm unaware of? Do you remember the story of how you and Mum met? I think I'm in a similar situation. I just feel like he's the one, and he said he's been looking for someone like me. History repeats itself, but are you sure he's a good man? Will you introduce me to him before you get married? Dad, don't worry. Alison paused, took a deep breath, and blurted out, It's Adam. Mr. Cassidy looked at his daughter in surprise, then at his driver, who was petting the cat and chatting with Mrs. Hewitt. When did you two get to know each other well enough to make such a life-changing decision? Dad, I'm telling you, I can just feel it. He's really nice. Can I have your permission? Why should I forbid it? Mr. Cassidy didn't understand. Well, he's just a simple driver. You might think it's indecent because you're the mayor and your daughter is marrying a driver, considering the reputation and all. Alison, my dear, such concerns about reputation are nonsense. I want you to be happy, you know. I want you to have a reliable person to lean on in difficult times. Adam is like that. I will be very glad if you two are together. Only, Mr. Cassidy paused, 
choosing his words carefully to avoid upsetting his daughter. Dad, Adam knows I'm pregnant, Alison interjected. Great, then. They returned to the others. Alison had wanted to take a walk before dinner, so Adam had volunteered to accompany her. Mrs. Hewitt and Mr. Cassidy exchanged smiles. Adam, may I ask you a question? Of course, you can ask me anything, Adam smiled. Why? Alison asked for clarification. Because you're my future wife, and I can't keep secrets from my wife. You're not kidding about getting married, are you? No, I never joke about such serious things. Then I agree, she said, and pulled herself to kiss him. After dinner, Adam left and the other occupants went to their rooms. As she drifted off to sleep, Alison dreamt of her new, bright future, her wedding, the birth of her son, and a happy life with her beloved husband in her father's house, under the loving guidance of Mrs. Hewitt. <laughs>